The Reign of King Edward III, attributed in part to William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Persons Represented Edward III, King of England Read by Ron Altman Edward, Prince of Wales, his son Read by David Goldfarb Earl of Warwick Read by Noel Badrian Earl of Montfort Read by Noel Badrian Earl of Derby Read by Chuck Williamson Earl Douglas Read by Robert Hoffman Earl of Salisbury Read by Robert Hoffman Lord Audley Read by Martin Geeson David, King of Scotland Read by Charlotte Durkett Lord Percy Read by Charlotte Durkett Lodowick, Edward's Confident Read by Rhonda Fetterman Villiers, a French Lord Read by Rhonda Fetterman Sir William Mountague Read by Jessa Mills King of Bohemia, aid to King John Read by Jessa Mills Sir John Copeland Read by Jessa Mills English Esquire Read by Aidan Brack English Herald Read by Aidan Brack Robert Starling himself Earl of Artois Read by Christine G. Gobain de Grey Read by Grace Garrett Another Captain Read by Grace Garrett John, King of France Read by Bruce Peary Charles, son of John, King of France Read by Capricia Page Philip, son of John, King of France Read by Amy Graymore Duke of Lorraine Read by Alan Matchstone First Poor Frenchman Read by Marcy First Citizen of Calais Read by Marcy Second Poor Frenchman Read by Anna Simon Second Citizen of Calais Read by Anna Simon A Captain of Calais Read by David Evans A Mariner Read by David Nicholl Third Poor Frenchman Read by Larry Womack First French Herald Read by Larry Womack Fourth Poor Frenchman Read by M.B. Second French Herald Read by M.B. Third French Herald Read by Tiffany Halla Colonna A French Woman Read by Tiffany Halla Colonna First Scottish Messenger Read by Vupahipu A Polish Captain, aide to King John Read by Vupahipu Second Scottish Messenger Read by Vupahipu A Poor Inhabitant of Calais Read by Vupahipu Philippa, Edward's Queen Read by Cathy Barrett Countess of Salisbury Read by Elizabeth Clatt Narrator Read by Algie Pug Scene Dispersed in England, Flanders and France Act One, Scene One London A Room of State in the Palace Flourish Enter King Edward, Derby, Prince Edward, Audley and Artois. Robert of Artois, banished though thou be from France, thy native country, yet with us thou shalt retain as great a signori, for we create thee Earl of Richmond here. And now go forwards with our pedigree. Who next succeeded Philip Le Bieu? Three sons of his, which all successfully did sit upon their father's regal throne, yet died, and left no issue of their loins. But was my mother sister unto those? She was, my lord, and only Isabel was all the daughters that this Philip had, whom afterward your father took to wife, and from the fragrant garden of her womb your gracious self, the flower of Europe's hope, derived its inheritor to France. But note the rancour of rebellious minds. When thus the lineage of Les Bieux was out, the French obscured your mother's privilege, and, 
though she were the next of blood, proclaimed John, of the house of Valois, now their king. The reason was, they say, the realm of France, replete with princes of great parentage, ought not to admit a govern to rule, except he be descended of the male, and that's the special ground of their contempt, wherewith they study to exclude your grace, but they shall find that forged ground of theirs to be but dusty heaps of brittle sand. Perhaps it would be thought a heinous thing that I, a Frenchman, should discover this, but heaven I call to record of my vows. It is not hate nor any private wrong, but love unto my country and the right provokes my tongue thus lavish in report. You are the lineage watchman of our peace, and John of Valois indirectly climbs. What then should subjects but embrace their king? Ah, wherein may our duty more be seen, than striving to rebate a tyrant's pride, and place a true shepherd of our commonwealth? This counsel, Artois, like to fruitful showers, hath added growth unto my dignity, and by the fiery vigour of thy words, hot courage is engendered in my breast, which heretofore was raked in ignorance but now doth mount with golden wings of fame, and will approve fair Isabel's descent, able to yoke their stubborn necks with steel that spurn against my sovereignty in France. Sound a horn. A messenger? Lord Audley, know from whence. Exit Audley and returns. The Duke of Lorraine, having crossed the seas, entreats he may have conference with your highness. Admit him, lords, that we may hear the news. Exeunt lords. King takes his state. Re-enter lords, with Lorraine attended. Say, Duke of Lorraine, wherefore art thou come? The most renowned prince, King John of France, doth greet thee, Edward, and by me commands that for so much as by his liberal gift the guyenne dukedom is entailed to thee thou do him lowly homage for the same and for that purpose here i summon thee repair to france within these forty days that there according as the custom is thou mayest be sworn true liegeman to our king or else thy title in that province dies and he himself will repossess the place. See how occasion laughs me in the face. No sooner minded to prepare for France, but straight I am invited, nay, with threats, upon a penalty enjoined to come. Twere but a childish part to say him nay. Lorraine, return this answer to thy lord. I mean to visit him as he requests, but how? not servilely disposed to bend, but like a conqueror to make him bow. His lame unpolished shifts are come to light, and truth hath pulled the vizard from his face, that set a gloss upon his arrogance. Dare he command a fealty in me? Tell him the crown that he usurps is mine, and where he sets his foot he ought to kneel, "'Tis not a petty dukedom that I claim, "'but all the whole dominions of the realm, "'which, if with grudging he refuse to yield, "'I'll take away those borrowed plumes of his, "'and send him naked to the wilderness.' "'Then, Edward, here, in spite of all thy lords, "'I do pronounce defiance to thy face.' "'Defiance, French man, we rebound it, back even to the bottom of thy master's throat and be it spoke with reverence of the king my gracious father and these other lords i hold thy message but as scurrilous and him that sent thee like the lazy drone crept up by stealth unto the eagle's nest from whence we'll shake him with so rough a storm as others shall be warned by his harm bid him leave of the lion's case he wears lest, meeting with the lion in the field, he chance to tear him piecemeal for his bride. The soundest counsel I can give his grace is to surrender ere he be constrained. 
a voluntary mischief hath less scorn than when reproach with violence is borne degenerate traitor viper to the place where thou was fostered in thine infancy bearest thou a part in this conspiracy he draws his sword lorraine behold the sharpness of this steel drawing his fervent desire that sits against my heart is far more thorny pricking than this blade that with the nightingale i shall be scared as oft as i dispose myself to rest until my colours be displayed in france this is my final answer so be gone it is not that nor any english brave afflicts me so as doth his poisoned view that his most false should most of all be true exeunt lorraine and train now lord our fleeting bark is under sail our gauge is thrown and war is soon begun but not so quickly brought unto an end enter montague but wherefore comes sir william montague how stands the league between the scot and us cracked and dissevered my renowned lord the treacherous king no sooner was informed of your withdrawing of your army back but straight forgetting of his former oath he made invasion on the bordering towns barwick is won newcastle spoiled and lost and now the tyrant hath begirt with siege the castle of roxborough where enclosed the countess salisbury is like to perish that is thy daughter warwick is it not whose husband hath in britain served so long about the planting of lord mountford there it is my lord ignoble david hast thou none to grieve but silly ladies with thy threatening arms but i will make you shrink your snaily horns first therefore oudly this shall be thy grace go levy footmen for our wars in france and ned take muster of our men-at-arms in every shire elect a several band let them be soldiers of a lusty spirit such as dread nothing but dishonour's blot but wary therefore since we do commence a famous war and with so mighty a nation derby be thou ambassador for us unto our father-in-law the earl of henault make him acquainted with our enterprise and likewise will him with our own allies that are in flanders to solicit to the emperor of alamein in our name myself whilst you are jointly thus employed will with these forces that i have at hand march and once more repulse the traitorous scot but sirs be resolute we shall have wars on every side and ned thou must begin now to forget thy study and thy books and urge thy shoulders to an armor's weight as cheerful sounding to my youthful spleen this tumult is of war's increasing broils as at the coronation of a king the joyful clamours of the people are when ave caesar they pronounce aloud within this school of honour i shall learn either to sacrifice my foes to death or in a rightful quarrel spend my breath then cheerfully forward each a several way in great affairs tis not to use delay exeunt act one scene two roxburgh before the castle enter the countess alas how much in vain my poor eyes gaze for succour that my sovereign should send ah cousin montague i fear thou wants the lively spirit sharply to solicit with vehement suit the king in my behalf thou dost not tell him what a grief it is to be the scornful captive of a scot either to be wooed with broad untuned oaths or forced by rough insulting barbarism thou dost not tell him if he here prevail how much they will deride us in the north and in their wild uncivil skipping gigs bray forth their conquest and our overthrow even in the barren bleak and fruitless air enter david and douglas lorraine i must withdraw the everlasting foe comes to the wall i'll closely step aside and list their babble blunt and full of pride my lord of lorraine to our brothers of france commend us 
as the man in Christendom, that we most reverence and entirely love, touching our embassage, return and say, that we with England will not enter parley, nor never make fair weather, or take truce, but burn our neighbours' towns, and so persist with eager rods beyond their city York, and never shall our bonny riders rest, nor rusting cankers have time to eat, their light-born snaffles, nor their nimble spurs, nor lay aside their jacks of grimold mail, nor hang their staves of grain Scottish axe, in peaceful wise upon their city walls, nor from their button tawny leather belts, dismiss their biting winyards, tell your king cry out, enough, spare England now for pity, farewell, and tell him that you leave us here before the castle, say you came from us, even when we had not yielded to our hands. I take my leave and fairly will return your acceptable greeting to my king. Exit Lorraine. Now, Douglas, to our former task again, for the diversion of this certain spoil. My liege, I crave the lady, and no more. Nay, soft ye, sir. First I must make my choice, and first I do bespeak her for myself. Why then, my liege, let me enjoy her jewels. And those are her own. She is liable to her, and who inherits her, hath those all. Enter a Scot in haste. My liege, as we were pricking on the hills, to fetch in booty marching hitherward, we might descry a mighty host of men. The sun reflecting on the armour showed a field of plaid, a wood of pigs advanced. Bethink your highness speedily herein, an easy march within four hours will bring the hindmost rank unto this place, my liege. Dislodge, dislodge, it is the King of England. Jemmy, my man, saddle my bonny black. Means thou to fight, Douglas. We are too weak. I know it well, my liege, and therefore fly. My lords of Scotland, will ye stay and drink? She mocks us, Douglas. I cannot endure it. Say, good my lord, which is he must have the lady, and which her jewels? I am sure, my lords, ye will not hence, till you have shared the spoils. She heard the messenger, and heard our talk, and now that comfort makes her scorn at us. Enter another messenger. Ah, my good lord, oh, we are all surprised. After the French ambassador, my liege, and tell him that you dare not ride to York, Excuse it that your bonny horse is lame. She heard that too. Intolerable grief. Woman, farewell, although I do not stay. Exeunt Scots. Tis not for fear, and yet you run away. O oh, happy comfort, welcome to our house, the confident and boisterous boasting Scot that swore before my walls they would not back for all the armed power of this land, with faceless fear that ever turns his back, turned hence against the blasting north-east wind upon the bare report and name of arms. Enter Montague. O oh, summer's day, see where my cousin comes. How fares my aunt? We are not Scots. Why do you shut your gates against your friends? Well may I give a welcome, cousin, to thee, for thou comest well to chase my foes from hence. The king himself is come in person hither. Dear aunt, descend and gratulate his highness. How may I entertain his majesty to show my duty and his dignity? Exit from above. Enter King Edward, Warwick, Artois, and others. What, are the stealing foxes fled and gone before we could uncouple at their heels? They are, my liege, but with a cheerful cry, hot hounds and hardy chase them at the heels. Enter Countess. This is the Countess, Warwick, is it not? Even she, my liege, whose beauty tyrants fear, as a may blossom with pernicious winds, hath sullied, withered, o cost and done. Hath she been fairer, Warwick, than she is? My gracious king, fair is she not at all. If that herself were by to stain herself, as I have seen her when she was herself. 
What strange enchantment lurked in those her eyes, When they excelled this excellence they have, That now her dim decline hath power To draw my subject eyes from pursing majesty, To gaze on her with doting admiration? In duty lower than the ground I kneel, And for my dull knees bow my feeling heart, To witness my obedience to your highness, with many millions of a subject's thanks for this your royal presence, whose approach hath driven war and danger from my gate. Lady, stand up. I come to bring thee peace. However thereby I have purchased war. No war to you, my liege. The Scots are gone, and gallop home toward Scotland with their hate. Least yielding here I pine in shameful love. Come, We'll pursue the Scots. Artois, away! A little while, my gracious sovereign, stay, And let the power of a mighty king honour our roof. My husband in the wars, when he shall hear it, Will triumph for joy. Then, dear my liege, now niggard not thy state, Being at the wall, enter our homely gate. Pardon me, Countess, I will come no near. I dreamed to-night of treason and i fear far from this place let ugly treason lie no farther off than her conspiring eye which shoots infected poison in my heart beyond repulse of wit or cure of art now in the sun alone it doth not lie with light to take light from a mortal eye for here two-day stars that mine eyes would see more than the sun steals mine own light from me. Contemplative desire, desire to be in contemplation that may master thee. Warwick, Artois, to horse, and let's away. What might I speak to make my sovereign stay? What needs a tongue to such a speaking eye that more persuades than winning oratory? Let not thy presence like the april sun flatter our earth and suddenly be done more happy do not make our outward wall than thou wilt grace our inner house withal our house my liege is like a country swain whose habit rude and manners blunt and plain presageth naught yet inly beautified with bounties riches and fair hidden pride for where the golden ore doth buried lie the ground undecked with nature's tapestry seems barren, sere, unfertile, fructless, dry. And where the upper turf of earth doth boast his pied perfumes and party-coloured coat, delve there, and find this issue and their pride to spring from ordure and corruption's side. But to make up my all too long compare, these ragged walls no testimony are what is within but like a cloak doth hide from weather's waste the undergarnished pride. More gracious than my terms can let thee be, entreat thyself to stay a while with me. As wise, as fair, what fond fit can be heard, when wisdom keeps the gate as beauty's guard? It shall attend while I attend on thee. Come on, my lords, here will I host to-night. Exeunt. End of Act One. Act Two of the Reign of King Edward the Third, attributed in part to William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One. The same. Gardens of the castle. Enter Lodowick. I might perceive his eye and her eye lost, his ear to drink her sweet tongue's utterance and changing passion, like in constant clouds that rack upon the carriage of the winds, increase and die in his disturbed cheeks. Lo, when she blushed, even then did he look pale, as if her cheeks by some enchanted power attracted had the cherry blood from his. Anon, with reverent fear, when she grew pale, 
his cheeks put on their scarlet ornaments. But no more like her oriental red than brick to coral or live things to dead. Why did he then thus counterfeit her looks? If she did blush, twas tender, modest shame, being in the sacred presence of a king. If he did blush, twas red, immodest shame, to veil his eyes amiss, being a king. If she looked pale, twas silly woman's fear to bear herself in presence of a king. If he looked pale, it was with guilty fear to dote amiss, being a mighty king. Then Scottish wars farewell. I fear twill prove a lingering English siege of peevish love. Here comes his highness, walking all alone. Enter King Edward. She is grown more fairer far since I came hither, her voice more silver every word than other, her wit more fluent. What a strange discourse unfolded she of David and his Scots! Even thus, quoth she, he spake, and then spoke broad with epithets and accents of the Scot, but somewhat better than the Scot could speak. And thus, quoth she, and answered then herself, for who could speak like her but she herself? breathes from the wall an angel's note from heaven of sweet defiance to her barbarous foes when she would talk of peace methinks her tongue commanded war to prison when of war it wakened caesar from his roman grave to hear war beautified by her discourse wisdom is foolishness but in her tongue Beauty a slander, but in her fair face. There is no summer, but in her cheerful looks, Nor frosty winter, but in her disdain. I cannot blame the Scots that did besiege her, For she is all the treasure of our land, But call them cowards, that they ran away, Having so rich and fair a cause to stay. Art thou there, Lodowick? Give me ink and paper. I will, my liege. And bid the lords hold on their play at chess, For we will walk and meditate alone. I will, my sovereign. This fellow is well read in poetry, And hath a lusty and persuasive spirit. I will acquaint him with my passion, Which he shall shadow with a veil of lawn, Through which the queen of beauties Queen shall see herself the ground of my infirmity. Exit Lodowick. Hast thou pen, ink, and paper ready, Lodowick? Ready, my liege. Then in the summer arbor sit by me. Make it our council house or cabinet. Since green our thoughts, green be the conventicle where we will ease us by disburdening them. Now, Lodowick, Invocate some golden muse To bring thee hither an enchanted pen That may for sighs set down true sighs indeed, Talking of grief to make thee ready groan, And when thou writest of tears, Encouch the word before and after With such sweet laments That it may raise drops in a tartar's eye, And make a flint-heart Scythian pitiful, for so much moving hath a poet's pen. Then, if thou be a poet, move thou so, and be enriched by thy sovereign's love. For if the touch of sweet concordant strings could force attendance in the ears of hell, how much more shall the strains of poet's wit beguile and ravish soft and humane minds? To whom, my lord, shall I direct my style? To one that shames the fair and sots the wise, Whose bod is an abstract or a brief, Contains each general virtue in the world. Better than beautiful thou must begin. Devise for fair a fairer word than fair, And every ornament that thou wouldst praise, Fly it 
a pitch above the soar of praise. For flattery fear thou not to be convicted, for were thy admiration ten times more, ten times ten thousand more, the worth exceeds of that thou art to praise, thy praise is worth. Begin, I will, to contemplate the while, forget not to set down how passionate, how heart-sick, and how full of languishment her beauty makes me. Write I to a woman? What beauty else could triumph over me? Or who but women do our love lays greet? What, thinkest thou, I did bid thee praise a horse? Of what condition or state she is, T'were requisite that I should know, my lord. Of such a state that hers is as a throne, And my estate the footstool where she treads. Then mayest thou judge what her condition is By the proportion of her mightiness. Write on, while I peruse her in my thoughts, Her voice to music or the nightingale. To music every summer leaping swain Compares his sunburnt lover when she speaks. And why should I speak of the nightingale? The nightingale sings of adulterate wrong, And that, compared, is too satirical. For sin, though sin, would not be so esteemed, But rather virtue sin, sin virtue deemed. Her hair, far softer than the silkworm's twist, like to a flattering glass doth make more fair the yellow amber, like a flattering glass comes in too soon. For writing of her eyes, I'll say that like a glass they catch the sun, and thence the hot reflection doth rebound against the breast, and burns my heart within. Ah, what a word of dissent makes my soul upon this voluntary ground of love. Come, Lodewick, hast thou turned thy ink to gold? If not, write but in letters capital my mistress's name, and it will gild thy paper. Read, Lord, read. Fill thou the empty hollows of mine ears with the sweet hearing of thy poetry. I have not to a period brought her praise. Her praise is as my love, both infinite, which apprehend such violent extremes that they disdain an ending period. Her beauty hath no match but my affection, hers more than most, mine most, and more than more. Hers more to praise than tell the sea by drops, nay, more than drop the massy earth by sands, and sand by sand print them in memory. Then wherefore talkest thou of a period to that which craves unended admiration? Read, let us hear. More fair and chaste than is the queen of shades. That line hath two faults, gross and palpable. Comparest thou her to the pale queen of night, who, being set in dark, seems therefore light? What is she when the sun lifts up his head, but like a fading taper, dim and dead. My love shall brave the eye of heaven at noon, and being unmasked, outshine the golden sun. What is the other fault, my sovereign lord? Read o'er the line again. More fair and chaste. I did not bid thee talk of chastity, to ransack so the treasure of her mind, for I had rather have her chased than chased. Out with the moonline, I will none of it, and let me have her likened to the sun. Say she hath thrice more splendor than the sun, that her perfections emulate the sun, that she breeds sweets as plenteous as the sun, that she doth thaw cold winter like the sun, that she doth cheer fresh summer like the sun, as she doth dazzle gazers like the sun. And in this application to the sun, bid her be free and general as the sun, who smiles upon the basest weed that grows as lovingly as on the fragrant rose. Let's see what follows that same moonlight line. More fair and chaste than is the queen of shades, more bold in constance. 
inconstance, then who? Then Judith was. O oh, monstrous line, put in the next a sword, and I shall woo her to cut of my head. Blot, blot, good Lodowick, let us hear the next. There's all that yet is done. I thank thee, then, thou hast done a little ill, but what is done is passing, passing ill. No, let the captain talk of boisterous war, the prisoner of immured dark constraint, the sick man best sets down the pangs of death, the man that starves the sweetness of a feast, the frozen soul the benefit of fire, and every grief his happy opposite. Love cannot sound well but in lovers' tongues. Give me the pen and paper, I will write. Enter Countess. But soft, here comes the treasurer of my spirit. Lodowick, thou knowest not how to draw a battle. These wings, these flankers, and these squadrons argue in thee defective discipline. Thou shouldest have placed this here, this other here. Pardon my boldness, my thrice gracious lords. Let my intrusion here be called my duty, that comes to see my sovereign how he fares. Go, draw the same. I tell thee in what form. I go. Exit Lodowick. Sorry I am to see my liege so sad. What may thy subject do to drive from thee thy gloomy consort, solemn melancholy? Ah, lady, I am blunt, and cannot straw the flowers of solace in a ground of shame. Since I came hither, Countess, I am wronged. Now God forbid that any in my house should think my sovereign wrong. Thrice, gentle king, acquaint me with your cause of discontent. How near, then, shall I be to remedy? As near, my liege, as all my woman's power can pawn itself to buy thy remedy. If thou speak'st true, then have I my redress. Engage thy power to redeem my joys, and I am joyful, Countess, else I die. I will, my liege. Swear, Countess, that thou wilt. By heaven I will. Then take thyself a little way aside, and tell thyself a king doth dote on thee. Say that within thy power it doth lie to make him happy, and that thou hast sworn to give him all the joy within thy power. Do this, and tell me when I shall be happy. All this is done, my thrice dread sovereign. That power of love that I have power to give thou hast with all devout obedience. Employ me how thou wilt in proof thereof. Thou hearst me say I do dote on thee. If on my beauty take it if thou canst, though little I do prize it ten times less. If on my virtue take it if thou canst, for virtue's store by giving doth augment. Be it on what it will, that I can give, and thou canst take away, inherit it. It is thy beauty that I would enjoy. Oh, were it painted, I would wipe it off and dispossess myself to give it thee. But, sovereign, it is soldered to my life. Take one and both, for like an humble shadow it haunts the sunshine of my summer's life. But thou mayest lend it me to sport withal. As easy may my intellectual soul be lent away, and yet my body live, as lend my body palace to my soul away from her, and yet retain my soul. My body is her bower, her court, her abbey, and she an angel, pure, divine, unspotted. If I should leave her house, my lord, to thee, I kill my poor soul, and my poor soul me. Didst thou not swear to give me what I would? I did, my liege, so what you would I could. I wish no more of thee than thou mayest give, nor beg I do not, but I rather buy, that is, thy love, and for that love of thine and rich exchange I tender to thee mine. But that your lips were sacred, my lord, you would profane the holy name of love. That love you offer me you cannot give, for Caesar owes that tribute to his queen. That love you beg of me I cannot give, for 
for Sarah owes that duty to her lord. He that doth clip or counterfeit your stamp shall die, my lord. And will your sacred self commit high treason against the King of Heaven, to stamp his image in forbidden metal, forgetting your allegiance and your oath? In violating marriage, sacred law, you break a greater honour than yourself. To be a king is of a younger house than to be married. Your progenitor, so reigning Adam on the universe, by God was honoured for a married man, but not by him anointed for a king. It is a penalty to break your statutes, though not enacted with your highness' hand. How much more to infringe the holy act made by the mouth of God, sealed with his hand! I know, my sovereign, in my husband's love, who now doth loyal service in his wars, doth but so try the wife of Salisbury, whether she will hear a wanton's tale or no, lest being therein guilty by my stay, from that, not from my liege, I turn away. Exit. Whether is her beauty by her words dying, or are her words sweet chaplains to her beauty? Like as the wind doth beautify a sail, and as a sail becomes the unseen wind, so do her words her beauties, beauties' words. Oh, that I were a honey-gathering bee to bear the comb of virtue from this flower, and not a poison-sucking envious spider to turn the juice I take to deadly venom. Religion is austere and beauty gentle, too strict a guardian for so fair a ward. Oh, that she were as is the heir to me! Why, so she is, for when I would embrace her, this do I, and catch nothing but myself. I must enjoy her, for I cannot beat with reason, and reproof fond love away. Enter Warwick. Here comes her father. I will work with him to bear my colors in this field of love. How is it that my sovereign is so sad? May I, with pardon, know your highness's grief, that my old endeavour will remove it. It shall not come along your majesty. A kind and voluntary gift thou profferest, that I was forward to have begged of thee. But, O oh, thou world, great nurse of flattery, why dost thou tip men's tongues with golden words, and pease their deeds with weight of heavy lead? that fair performance cannot follow promise. Oh, that a man might hold the heart's close book, and choke the lavish tongue when it doth utter the breath of falsehood not charactered there! Far be it from the honour of my age, that I should owe bright gold and render lead. Age is a cynic, not a flatterer. I say again, that if I knew your grief, and that by me it may be lessened, my proper harm should buy your highness good. These are the vulgar tenders of false men, that never pay the duty of their words. Thou wilt not stick to swear what thou hast said. But even when thou knowest my grief's condition, this rash, disgorged vomit of thy word thou wilt eat up again, and leave me helpless. By heaven I will not, though your majesty did bid me run upon your sword and die. Say that my grief is no way medicinable, but by the loss and bruising of thine honour. If nothing but that loss may vantage you, I would account that loss my vantage too. Think'st that thou canst unswear thy oath again? I cannot, nor I would not, if I could. But if thou dost, what shall I say to thee? What may be said to any perjured villain? that breaks the sacred warrant of an oath. What wilt thou say to one that breaks an oath? That he hath broke his faith with God and man, and from them both stands excommunicate. What office were it to suggest a man to break a lawful and religious vow? An office for the devil, not for man. That devil's office must thou do for me or break thy oath, or cancel all the bonds of love and duty twixt thyself and me. And therefore, Warwick, if thou art thyself, the lord and master of thy word and oath, go to thy daughter, and in my behalf command her, woo her, win her any ways, 
to be my mistress and my secret love. I will not stand to hear thee make reply. Thy oath break hers, or let thy sovereign die. Exit. O doting king, O detestable office, well may I tempt myself to wrong myself, when he hath sworn me by the name of God to break a vow made by the name of God. What if I swear by this right hand of mine to cut this right hand off? The better way were to profane the idol than to confound it, but neither will I do. I'll keep mine oath, and to my daughter make a recantation of all the virtue I have preached to her. I'll say she must forget her husband Salisbury if she remember to embrace the king. I'll say an oath may easily be broken, but not so easily pardoned, being broken. I'll say it is true charity to love, but not true love to be so charitable. I'll say his greatness may bear out the shame, but not his kingdom can buy out the sin. I'll say it is my duty to persuade, but not her honesty to give consent. Enter Countess. See where she comes. Was never father had against his child an embassage so bad? My lord and father, I have sought for you. My mother and the peers importune you to keep in presence of his majesty, and do your best to make his highness merry. Aside. How shall I enter this graceless arrant? I must not call her child, for where's the father that will in such a suit seduce his child? Then, wife of Salisbury, shall I so begin? No, he's my friend, and where is found the friend that will do friendship such endamagement? To the Countess. Neither my daughter nor my dear friend's wife. I am not Warwick, as thou think'st I am but an attorney from the court of hell that thus have housed my spirit in his form to do a message to thee from the king the mighty king of england dotes on thee he that hath power to take away thy life hath power to take thy honour then consent to pawn thine honour rather than thy life honour is often lost and got again but life once gone hath no recovery the sun that withers hay doth nourish grass. The king that would disdain thee will advance thee. The poets write that great Achilles' spear could heal the wound it made. The moral is, what mighty men must do, they can amend. The lion doth become his bloody jaws and grace his foragement by being mild when vassal fear lies trembling at his feet. The king will in his glory hide thy shame, and those that gaze on him to find out thee will lose their eyesight looking in the sun. What can one drop of poison harm the sea, whose huge vastures can digest the ill and make it lose his operation? The king's great name will temper thy misdeeds and give the bitter potion of reproach a sugared, sweet and most delicious taste. Besides, it is no harm to do the thing, which without shame could not be left undone. Thus have I, in His Majesty's behalf, apparelled sin in virtuous sentences, and dwell upon thy answer in his suit. Unnatural besiege! Woe me, unhappy! To have escaped the danger of my foes, and to be ten times worse injured by friends! Hath he no means to stain my honest blood, but to corrupt the author of my blood to be his scandalous and vile solicitor? No marvel, though the branches be then infected, when poison hath encompassed the root. No marvel, though the leprous infant die, when the stern dame envenometh the dug. Why, then, give sin a passport to offend, and youth the dangerous reign of liberty? Blot out the strict forbidding of the law, and cancel every canon that prescribes a shame for shame, or penance for offence. No, let me die, if his too boisterous will will have it so, before I will consent to be an actor in his graceless lust. Why, now thou speak'st as I would have thee speak, and mark how I unsay my words again. 
an honourable grave is more esteemed than the polluted closet of a king the greater man the greater is the thing be it good or bad that he shall undertake an unreputed moat flying in the sun presents a greater substance than it is the freshest summer's day doth soonest taint the loathed carrion that it seems to kiss deep are the blows made with a mighty axe that sin doth ten times aggravate itself that is committed in a holy place an evil deed done by authority is sin and subornation deck an ape in tissue and the beauty of the robe adds but the greater scorn unto the beast a spacious field of reason could i urge between his glory daughter and thy shame that poison shows worst in a golden cup dark nights seem darker by the lightning flash lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds and every glory that inclines to sin the shame is treble by the opposite so leave i with my blessing in thy bosom which then convert to a most heavy curse when thou convertest from honour's golden name to the black faction of bed-blotting shame i'll follow thee and when my mind turns so my body sink my soul in endless woe exeunt act two scene two the same a room in the castle enter at one door darby from france at another door audley with a drum thrice noble audley well encountered here how is it with our sovereign and his peers tis full a fortnight since i saw his highness what time he sent me forth to muster men which i accordingly have done and bring them hither in fair array before his majesty what news my lord of derby from the emperor as good as we desire the emperor hath yielded to his highness's friendly aid and makes our king lieutenant-general in all his lands and large dominions then via for the spacious bounds of france what doth his highness leap to hear these news i have not yet found time to open them the king is in his closet malcontent for what i know not but he gave in charge till after dinner none should interrupt him the countess salisbury and her father warwick archwees and all look underneath the brows undoubtedly then something is amiss trumpet within the trumpets sound the king is now abroad enter the king here comes his highness befall my sovereign all my sovereign's wish ah that thou wert a witch to make it so the emperor greeteth you presenting letters would it were the countess and hath accorded to your highness sweet thou liest she hath not but i would she had all love and duty to my lord the king well all but one is none what news with you i have my leech levied those horse and foot according to your charge and brought them hither then let those foot trudge hence upon those horse according to our discharge and be gone Darby, I'll look upon the countess's mind anon. The countess's mind, my liege? I mean the emperor. Leave me alone. What is his mind? Let's leave him to his humor. Exeunt. Thus from the heart's abundance speaks the tongue. Countess for emperor, and indeed why not? She is as imperator over me, and I to her am as a kneeling vassal that observes the pleasure or displeasure of her eye enter lodowick what says the more than cleopatra's match to caesar now that yet my liege ere night she will resolve your majesty drum within what drum is this that thunders forth this march to start the tender cupid in my bosom poor shipskin how it brawls with him that beateth it go break the thundering parchment bottom out 
and I will teach it to conduct sweet lines unto the bosom of a heavenly nymph, for I will use it as my writing paper, and so reduce him from a scolding drum to be the herald and dear counsel-bearer, betwixt a goddess and a mighty king. Go, bid the drummer learn to touch the lute, or hang him in the braces of his drum, for now we think it an uncivil thing to trouble heaven with such harsh resounds. Away! Exit. The quarrel that I have requires no arms, but these of mine, and these shall meet my foe in a deep march of penetrable groans. My eyes shall be my arrows, and my sighs shall serve me as the vantage of the wind to whirl away my sweetest artillery. Ah, but alas, she wins the son of me, for that is she herself, and thence it comes that poets term the wanton warrior blind. But love hath eyes as judgment to his steps, till too much loved glory dazzles them. Enter Lodowick. How now? My liege, the drum that stroked the lusty march stands with Prince Edward, your thrice valiant son. Enter Prince Edward. I see the boy. Oh, how his mother's face, modelled in his, corrects my strayed desire, and rates my heart and chides my thievish eye, who, being rich enough in seeing her, yet seeks elsewhere, and basest theft is that which cannot cloak itself on poverty. Now, boy, what news? I have assembled, my dear lord and father, the choicest buds of all our English blood for our affairs in France, and here we come to take direction from your majesty. Still do I see in him delineate his mother's visage, those his eyes are hers, who looking wistily on me make me blush, for faults against themselves give evidence. Lust is fire and men like Lanthorn show light lust within themselves, even through themselves. Away, loose silks of wavering vanity! Shall the large limit of fair Britain by me be overthrown, and shall I not master this little mansion of myself? Give me an armor of eternal steel! I go to conquer kings, and shall I not then subdue myself, and be my enemy's friend? It must not be. Come, boy, forward, advance. Let's with our colors sweet the air of France. Enter Lodowick. My liege, the countess, with a smiling cheer, desires access unto your majesty. Why, there it goes. That very smile of hers hath ransomed captive France, and set the king, the dauphin, and the peers at liberty. Go, leave me, Ned, and revel with thy friends. Exit, Prince Edward. Thy mother is but black, and thou like her dost put it in my mind how foul she is. Go, fetch the countess hither in thy hand, and let her chase away these winter clouds, for she gives beauty both to heaven and earth. Exit, Lodowick. The sin is more to hack and hew poor men than to embrace in an unlawful bed the register of all rarities since Lethern Adam till this youngest hour. Enter Countess, escorted by Lodowick. Go, Lodowick, put thy hand into my purse. Play, spend, give, riot, waste, do what thou wilt, so thou wilt hence a while and leave me here. Exit, Lodowick. Now, my soul's playfellow, art thou come to speak the more than heavenly word of yea to my objection and thy beauteous love? My father on his blessing hath commanded. That thou shalt yield to me? Ay, dear my liege, your due. And that, my dearest love, can be no less than right for right and tender love for love and wrong for wrong, and endless hate for hate. But, sith I see your majesty so bent, that my unwillingness, my husband's love, your high estate, nor no respect respected can be my help, but that your mightiness will overbear and awe these dear regards, I bind my discontent to my content, 
and what I would not, I'll compel, I will, provided that yourself remove those lets that stand between your highness love and mine. Name them, fair countess, and by heaven I will. It is their lives that stand between our love, that I would have choked up, my sovereign. Whose lives, my lady? My thrice-loving liege, your queen, and Salisbury, my wedded husband, who living hath that title in our love, that we cannot bestow but by their death. Thy opposition is beyond our law. So is your desire. If the law can hinder you to execute the one, let it forbid you to attempt the other. I cannot think you love me as you say, unless you do make good what you have sworn. No more thy husband and the queen shall die. Fairer thou art by far than Hero was, beardless Leander not so strong as I. He swam an easy current for his love, but I will through a hell's point of blood to arrive at Cestus where my hero lies. Nay, you'll do more. You'll make the river to with their heart bloods that keep our love asunder, of which my husband and your wife are twain. Thy beauty makes them guilty of their death, and gives in evidence that they shall die. Upon which verdict I their judge condemn them. Aside. O perjured beauty, more corrupted judge, when to the great star-chamber o'er our heads the universal sessions cause to count this packing evil, we both shall tremble for it. What says my fair love? Is she resolute? Resolute to be dissolute, and therefore this. Keep but thy word, great king, and I am thine. Stand where thou dost, I'll part a little from thee and see how I will yield me to thy hands. Turning suddenly upon him, and showing two daggers. Here by my side doth hang my wedding-knifes. Take thou the one, and with it kill thy queen, and learn by me to find her where she lies. And with this other I'll dispatch my love, which now lies fast asleep within my heart. When they are gone, then I'll consent to love. Stir not, lascivious king, to hinder me. My resolution is more nimbler far than thy prevention can be in my rescue. And if thou stir, I strike. Therefore stand still, and hear the choice that I will put thee to. Either swear to leave thy most unholy suit, and never henceforth to solicit me. Or else, by heaven, this sharp, pointed knife shall stain thy earth with that which thou wouldst stain my poor chaste blood. Swear, Edward, swear, or I will strike and die before thee here. Even by that power, I swear, that gives me now the power to be ashamed of myself, I never mean to part my lips again in any words that tends to such a suit arise, true English lady, whom our isle may better boast of than ever Roman might of her, whose ransacked treasury hath tasked the vain endeavour of so many pens. Arise, and be my fault thy honour's fame, which after ages shall enrich thee with. I am awakened from this idle dream. Warwick, my son, Darby, Artois, and Audley, brave warriors all, where are you all this while? Enter all. Warwick, I make thee warden of the north. Thou, Prince of Wales, and Audley, straight to sea, scour to New Haven. Some there stay for me. Myself, Artois, and Darby will through Flanders to greet our friends there, and to crave their aid. This night will scarce suffice a faithful lover, for ere the sun shall gild the eastern sky, we'll wake him with our martial harmony. Exeunt. End of Act Two Act Three of The Reign of King Edward the Third, attributed in part to William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene 1. Flanders, the French camp. Enter King John of France, his two sons, Charles of Normandy, and Philip, and the Duke of Lorraine. Here, till our navy of a thousand sail have made a breakfast to our foe by sea, let us encamp, to wait their happy speed. Lorraine, what readiness is Edward in? How hast thou heard that he provided is of martial furniture for this exploit? To lay aside unnecessary soothing, and not to spend the time in circumstance, tis bruited for a certainty, my lord, that he's exceedingly strongly fortified. His subjects flock as willingly to war as if unto a triumph they were led. England was wont to harbour malcontents, bloodthirsty and seditious Catalines, spendthrifts, and such as gape for nothing else but changing and alteration of the state. And is it possible that they are now so loyal in themselves? All but the Scot, who solemnly protests, as heretofore I have informed his grace, never to sheathe his sword or take a truce ah that's the anchorage of some better hope but on the other side to think what friends king edward hath retained in netherland among those ever bibbing epicures those frothy dutchmen puffed with double beer that drink and swill in every place they come doth not a little aggravate mine ire besides we hear the emperor conjoins and stalls him in his own authority but all the mightier that their number is the greater glory reaps the victory some friends have we beside domestic power the stern polonian and the warlike dane the king of bohemia and of sicily are all become confederates with us and as i think are marching hither apace drum within but soft i hear the music of their drums by which i guess that their approach is near enter the king of bohemia with danes and a polonian captain with other soldiers another way king john of france as league and neighbourhood requires when friends are any way distressed i come to aid thee with my country's force and from great moscow fearful to the turk and lofty poland nurse of hardy men i bring these servitors to fight for thee who willingly will venture in thy cause welcome bohemian king and welcome all this your great kindness i will not forget besides your plentiful rewards in crowns that from our treasury ye shall receive there comes a hare-brained nation decked in pride the spoil of whom will be a treble gain and now my hope is full my joy complete at sea we are as puissant as the force of agamemnon in the haven of troy by land with xerxes we compare of strength whose soldiers drank up rivers in their thirst then bayard like blind overweening ned to reach at our imperial diadem is either to be swallowed of the waves or hacked to pieces when thou comest ashore enter mariner near to the coast i have descried my lord as i was by in my watchful charge the proud armada of king edward's ships which at the first far off when i did ken seemed as it were a grove of withered pines but drawing near their glorious bright aspect their streaming ensigns wrought of coloured silk like to a meadow full of sundry flowers adorns the naked bosom of the earth Majestical the order of their course, figuring the horned circle of the moon, and on the top gallant of the admiral, and likewise all the handmaids of his train, the arms of England and of France unite, are quartered equally by herald's art. Thus, tightly carried with a merry gale, they plough the ocean hitherward amain. Dare he already crop the fleur de luce? i hope the honey being gathered thence he with the spider afterward approached shall suck forth deadly venom from the leaves but where's our navy how are they prepared to wing themselves against this flight of ravens they having knowledge brought them by the scouts did break from anchor straight and puffed with rage no otherwise than were their sails with wind made forth as when the empty eagle flies to satisfy his hungry griping maw 
there's for thy news return unto thy bark and if thou scape the bloody stroke of war and do survive the conflict come again and let us hear the manner of the fight exit mariner mean space my lords tis best we be dispersed to several places lest they chance to land first you my lord with your bohemian troops shall pitch your batailles on the lower hand my eldest son the duke of normandy together with the aid of muscovites shall climb the higher ground another way here in the middle cost betwixt you both philip my youngest boy and i will lodge so lors be gone and look unto your charge you stand for france an empire fair and large Exeunt now tell me philip what is thy concept touching the challenge that the english make i say my lord claim edward what he can and bring he ne'er so plain a pedigree tis you are in the possession of the crown and that's the surest point of all the law but were it not yet ere he should prevail i'll make a conduit of my dearest blood or chase those straggling upstarts home again well said young philip call for bread and wine that we may cheer our stomachs with repast to look our foes more sternly in the face a table and provisions brought in the battle heard afar off now is begun the heavy day at sea fight frenchmen fight be like the field of bears when they defend their younglings in the caves stir angry nemesis the happy helm that with the sulphur battles of your rage the english fleet may be dispersed and sunk shot o oh, father how this echoing cannon shot like sweet harmony digests my eats now boy thou hearest what thundering terror it is to buckle for a kingdom's sovereignty the earth with giddy trembling when it shakes or when the exhalations of the air breaks in extremity of lightning flash affrights not more than kings when they dispose to show the rancour of their high swollen hearts retreat retreat is sounded one side hath the worse oh if it be the french sweet fortune turn and in thy turning change the forward winds that with advantage of a favouring sky our men may vanquish and the other fly enter mariner my heart misgives say mirror of pale death to whom belongs the honour of this day relate i pray thee if thy breath will serve the sad discourse of this discomfiture i will my lord my gracious sovereign france hath ta'en the foil and boasting edward triumphs with success these iron-hearted navies when last i was reported to your grace both full of angry spleen of hope and fear hasting to meet each other in the face at last conjoined and by their admiral our admiral encountered many shot by this the other that beheld these twain gave earnest penny of a further rack like fiery dragons took their haughty flight and likewise meeting from their smoky wombs sent many grim ambassadors of death then gan the day to turn to gloomy night and darkness did as well enclose the quick as those that were but newly reft of life no leisure served for friends to bid farewell and if it had the hideous noise was such as each to other seemed deaf and dumb purple the sea whose channel filled as fast with streaming gore that from the maimed fell as did her gushing moisture break into the crannied cleftures of the through-shot planks here flew a head dissevered from the trunk there mangled arms and legs were tossed aloft as when a whirlwind takes the summer dust and scatters it in the middle of the air then might ye see the reeling vessels split and tottering sink into the ruthless flood until their lofty tops were seen no more all shifts were tried both for defence and hurt and now the effect of valour and of force of resolution and of cowardice we lively pictures how the one for fame the other by compulsion laid about much did the nonpareil that brave ship so did the black snake of bullen than which a bonnier vessel never yet spread sail but all in vain both sun the wind and tide revolted all unto our foemen's side that we perforce were fain to give them way and they are landed thus my tale is done 
We have untimely lost, and they have won. Then rests there nothing but with present speed to join our several forces all in one, and bid them battle ere they range too far. Come, gentle Philip, let us hence depart. This soldier's words have pierced thy father's heart. Exeunt. Act three, scene two. Picardy. Fields near Cressy. Enter two Frenchmen, a woman and two little children meet them, and other citizens. Well met, my masters. How now? What's the news? And wherefore are ye laden thus with stuff? What? Is it quarter day that you remove, and carry bag and baggage too? Quarter day? Ay, and quartering day, I fear. Have ye not heard the news that flies abroad? What news? How the French navy is destroyed at sea, and that the English army is arrived. What then? What then, quoth you? Why, is not time to fly, when envy and destruction is so nigh? Content thee, man, they are far enough from hence, and will be met, I warrant ye, to their cost, before they break so far into the realm. Aye, so the grasshopper doth spend the time in mirthful jollity till winter come, and then too late he would redeem his time, when frozen cold hath nipped his careless head. He that no sooner will provide a cloak than when he sees it doth begin to rain, may, peradventure for his negligence, be thoroughly washed when he suspects it not. We that have charge and such a train as this, must look in time to look for them and us, least when we would, we cannot be relieved. Belike you then despair of all success, and think your country will be subjugate? We cannot tell. Tis good to fear the worst. Yet rather fight, then, like unnatural sons, forsake your loving parents in distress. Tush! They that have already taken arms are many fearful millions in respect of that small handful of our enemies, but tis a rightful quarrel must prevail. Edward is son unto our late king's sister, when John Valois is three degrees removed. Besides, there goes a prophecy abroad, published by one that was a friar once, whose oracles have many times proved true. And now he says, the time will shortly come, when, as a lion roused in the west, shall carry hence the fleur de luce of France. These I can tell you, and such like surmises, strike many French men cold into the heart. Enter a Frenchman. Fly, countrymen and citizens of France! Sweet flowering peace, the root of happy life, is quite abandoned and expulsed the land, instead of whom ransacked constraining war sits like the ravens upon your houses' tops. Slaughter and mischief walk within your streets, and unrestrained make havocs they pass, the form whereof even now myself beheld upon this fair mountain whence I came. For so far as I directed mine eyes, I might perceive five cities all on fire, cornfields and vineyards burning like an oven, and as the reeking vapour in the wind turned but aside, I likewise might discern the poor inhabitants escaped the flame, full numberless upon the soldiers' pikes. Three ways these dreadful ministers of wrath do tread the measures of their tragic march. Upon the right hand comes the conquering king, upon the left his hot, unbridled son, and in the midst our nation's glittering host, all which, though distant yet, conspire in one, to leave a desolation where they come. Fly, therefore, citizens, if you be wise, seek out some habitation further off. Here if you stay, your wives will be abused, your treasure shared before your weeping eyes. Shelter yourselves, for now the storm doth rise. Away! Away! And thinks I hear their drums. Ah, wretched France, I greatly fear thy fall. Thy glory shaketh like a tottering wall. Exeunt. Act three, scene three. The same. Drums. Enter King Edward and the Earl of Derby with soldiers and Gobain de Grey. Where's the Frenchman by whose cunning guide we found the shallow of this river zone, and had directions how to pass the sea? Here, my good lord. How art thou called? Tell me thy name. 
Gobin de Grey, if it please your majesty. Then, Gobin, for the service thou hast done, we here enlarge and give thee liberty, and for recompense beside this good, thou shalt receive five hundred marks in gold. I know not how we should have met our son, whom now in heart I wish I might behold. Enter Artois. Good news, my lord. The prince is hard as hand, and with him comes Lord Audley and the rest, whom since our landing we could never meet. Enter Prince Edward, Lord Audley, and soldiers. Welcome, fair prince. How hast thou sped, my son, since thy arrival on the coast of France? Successfully, I thank the gracious heavens. Some of their strongest cities we have won, as Harflu, Low, Crote, and Carantine, and others wasted, leaving at our heels a wide apparent field and beaten path for solitariness to progress in. Yet those that would submit we kindly pardoned, but who in scorn refused our proffered peace endured the penalty of sharp revenge. Ah, France, why shouldst thou be thus obstinate against the kind embracement of thy friends? How gently had we thought to touch thy breast, and set our foot upon thy tender mould! But that in froward and disdainful pride, thou, like a skittish and untamed colt, dost start aside and strike us with thy heels! But tell me, Ned, in all thy warlike course, Hast thou not seen the usurping king of France? Yes, my good lord, and not two hours ago, with full a hundred thousand fighting men, upon the one side of the river's bank and on the other both his multitudes. I feared he would have cropped our smaller power, but happily, perceiving your approach, he hath withdrawn himself to Cressy Plains, where, as it seemeth by his good array, he means to bid us battle presently. He shall be welcome. That's the thing we crave. Enter King John, Dukes of Normandy and Lorraine, King of Bohemia, young Philip, and soldiers. Edward, know that John, the true King of France, musing thou shouldst encroach upon his land, and in thy tyrannous proceeding slay his faithful subjects and subvert his towns, spits in thy face and in this manner following abrades thee with thine arrogant intrusion first i condemn thee for a fugitive a thievish pirate and a needy mate one that hath either no abiding place or else inhabiting some barren soil where neither herb or fruitful grain is had doest altogether live by pilfering next insomuch thou hast infringed thy faith broke liege and solemn covenant made with me i hold thee for a false pernicious wretch and last of all although i scorn to cope with one so much inferior to myself yet in respect thy thirst is all for gold thy labour rather to be feared than loved to satisfy thy lust in either part here am i come and with me have I brought exceeding store of treasure, pearl, and coin. Leave, therefore, now to persecute the weak, and armed entering conflict with the armed. Let it be seen, mongest other petty thefts, how thou canst win this pillage manfully. If gall or wormwood have a pleasant taste, then is thy salutation honey sweet. But as the one hath no such property, so is the other most satirical yet what how i regard thy worthless taunts if thou have uttered them to foil my fame or dim the reputation of my birth know that thy wolvish barking cannot hurt if slyly to insinuate with the world and with a strumpet's artificial line to paint thy vicious and deformed cause be well assured the counterfeit will fade, and in the end thy foul defects be seen. But if thou didst it to provoke me on, as who should say I were but timorous, or coldly negligent, did need a spur, bethink thyself how slack I was at sea, how since my landing I have won no towns, 
entered no further but upon the coast, and there have ever since securely slept. But if I have been otherwise employed, imagine, Valois, whether I intend to skirmish not for pillage, but for the crown which thou dost wear, and that I vow to have, or one of us shall fall into his grave. Look not for cross invectives at our hands, or railing execrations of despite. Let creeping serpents hid in hollow banks sting with their tongues. We have remorseless swords, and they shall plead for us and our affairs. Yet thus much, briefly, by my father's leave, as all the immodest poison of thy throat is scandalous and most notorious lies, and our pretended quarrel is truly just, so end the battle when we meet to-day. May either of us prosper and prevail, or, luckless, cursed, receive eternal shame. That needs no further question, and I know his conscience witnesseth, it is my right. Therefore, Valois, say, wilt thou yet resign, before the sickles thrust into the corn, or that enkindled fury turn to flame? Edward, I know what right thou hast in France, and ere I basely will resign my crown, this champion field shall be a pool of blood, and all our prospect as a slaughter-house. Ay, that approves thee, tyrant, what thou art, no father, king, or shepherd of thy realm, but one that tears her entrails with thy hands, and like a thirsty tiger sucks her blood. You peers of France, why do you follow him that is so prodigal to spend your lives? Whom should they follow, aged impotent, but he that is their true-born sovereign? O breedest thou him, because within his face time hath engraved deep characters of age? No, these grave scholars of experience, like stiff-grown oaks, will stand immovable when whirlwind quickly turns up younger trees. Was ever any of thy father's house king but thyself before this present time? Edward's great lineage by the mother's side five hundred years hath held the sceptre up. Judge then, conspirators, by this descent, which is the true-born sovereign, this or that? Father, range your battles. Prate no more. These English fain would spend the time in words. That night approaching, they might escape unfought. Lords and my loving subjects, now's the time that your intended force must bide the touch. Therefore, my friends, consider this in brief. He that you fight for is your natural king, he against whom you fight a foreigner. He that you fight for rules in clemency, and reigns you with a mild and gentle bit. He against whom you fight, if he prevail, will straight enthrone himself in tyranny, makes slaves of you, and with a heavy hand curtail and curb your sweetest liberty. Then, to protect your country and your king, let but the haughty courage of your hearts answer the number of your able hands, and we shall quickly chase these fugitives. For what's this, Edward, but a belly-god, a tender and lascivious wantonness, that the other day was almost dead for love? And what, I pray you, is his goodly guard? such as but scant them of their chines of beef and take away their downy feather-beds and presently they are as rusty stiff as twere a many overridden jades then frenchmen scorn that such should be your lords and rather bind ye them in captive bands vive le roi god save king john of france now on this plain of cressy spread yourselves and Edward, when thou darest, begin the fight. Exeunt King John, Charles, Philip, Lorraine, Bohemia, and forces. We presently will meet thee, John of France. And, English lords, let us resolve this day, 
either to clear us of that scandalous crime, or be entombed in our innocence. And Ned, because this battle is the first that ever yet thou foughtest in pitched field, as ancient custom is of martialists, to dub thee with a tip of chivalry. In solemn manner we will give thee arms. Come, therefore, heralds, orderly, bring forth a strong attirement for the prince, my son. Enter four heralds, bringing in a coat of armour, a helmet, a lance, and a shield. Edward Plantagenet, in the name of God, as with this armour I impale thy breast, so be thy noble, unrelenting heart walled in with flint of matchless fortitude, that never base affections enter there. Fight and be valiant, conquer where thou comest. Now follow, lords, and do him honour too. Edward Plantagenet, Prince of Wales, as I do set this helmet on thy head, wherewith the chamber of thy brain is fenced, so may the temples with Bologna's hand be still adorned with laurel victory. <sighs> Fight and be valiant. Conquer where thou comest. Edward Plantagenet, Prince of Wales, receive this lance into thy manly hand. Use it in fashion of a brazen pen to draw forth bloody stratagems in France and print thy valiant deeds in honour's book. Fight and be valiant, vanquish where thou comest. Edward Plantagenet, Prince of Wales, hold, take this target, wear it on thy arm, and may the view thereof, like Perseus' shield, astonish and transform thy gazing foes to senseless images of meagre death. Fight and be valiant, conquer where thou comest. Now wants there naught but knighthood, which deferred we leave, till thou hast won it in the field. My gracious father, and ye forward peers, this honour you have done me animates and cheers my green, yet scarce appearing strength, with comfortable good presaging signs. No otherwise than did old Jacob's words, when as he breathed his blessings on his sons. These hallowed gifts of yours, when I profane or use them not to glory of my God, to patronage the fatherless and poor, or for the benefit of England's peace, benumb my joints, wax feeble both mine arms, wither my heart, that like a sapless tree I may remain the map of infamy. Then thus our steeled battles shall be ranged. The leading of the wayward Ned is thine to dignify whose lusty spirit the more we temper it with Audley's gravity. That courage and experience joined in one, your manage may be second unto none. For the main battles I will guide myself, and Darby in a rearward march behind. That orderly disposed and set in ray, let us to horse, and God grant us the day. Exeunt. Act three, scene four. The same. Alarum. Enter a many Frenchmen flying. After them, Prince Edward running. Then enter King John and Duke of Lorraine. O oh, Lorraine, say, what mean our men to fly? Our number is far greater than our foes. The garrison of Genoese, my lord, that came from Paris weary with their march, grudging to be so suddenly employed, no sooner in the forefront took their place, but straight retiring, so dismayed the rest, as likewise they betook themselves to flight, in which, for haste to make a safe escape, more in the clustering throng are pressed to death than by the enemy, a thousandfold. O oh, hapless fortune, let us yet assay if we can counsel some of them to stay. Exeunt. Act three, scene five. The same. Enter King Edward and Audley. Lord Audley, whiles our son is in the chase, withdraw our powers unto this little hill, and here a season let us breathe ourselves. I will, my lord. Exit. Sound retreat. Just dooming heaven, whose secret providence to our gross judgment is inscrutable, 
how are we bound to praise thy wondrous works that hast this day given way unto the right and made the wicked stumble at themselves enter artois rescue king edward rescue for thy son rescue artois what is he prisoner or by violence fell beside his horse neither my lord but narrowly beset with turning frenchmen whom he did pursue as tis impossible that he should scape except your highness presently descend tut let him fight we gave him arms to-day and he is labouring for a knighthood man enter darby the prince my lord the prince oh succour him he is close in compassed with a world of odds then will he win a world of honour too if he by valour can redeem him thence if not what remedy we have more sons than one to comfort our declining age enter audley oh, renowned edward give me leave i pray to lead my soldiers where i may relieve your grace's son in danger to be slain the snares of french like emmets on a bank muster about him whilst he lion-like entangled in the net of their assaults frantically rends and bites the woven toil but all in vain he cannot free himself oudly content i will not have a man on pain of death sent forth to succour him that is the day ordained by destiny to season his courage with those grievous thoughts that if he breaketh out nestor's years on earth will make him savour still of this exploit ah but he shall not live to see those days why then his epitaph is lasting praise yet good my lord tis too much wilfulness to let his blood be spilt that may be saved exclaim no more for none of you can tell whether a borrowed aid will serve or no perhaps he is already slain or ta'en and dare a falcon when she's in her flight and ever after she'll be haggard like let edward be delivered by our hands and still in danger he'll expect the like but if himself himself redeem from thence he will have vanquished cheerful death and fear and ever after dread their force no more than if they were but babes or captive slaves o oh, cruel father farewell edward then farewell sweet prince the hope of chivalry oh would my life might ransom him from death retreat sounded but soft methinks i hear the dismal charge of trumpets loud retreat all are not slain i hope that went with him some will return with tidings good or bad enter prince edward in triumph bearing in his hands his shivered lance and the king of bohemia born before wrapped in the colours they run and embrace him o oh, joyful sight victorious edward lives welcome brave prince welcome plantagenet kneels and kisses his father's hand First having done my duty as beseemed, lords, I regreet you all with hearty thanks. And now behold, after my winter's toil, my painful voyage on the boisterous sea of war's devouring gulfs and steely rocks, I bring my fraught unto the wished port, my summer's hope, my travel's sweet reward. And here, with humble duty, I present this sacrifice, this first fruit of my sword, cropped and cut down even at the gate of death, the king of Boam, father, whom I slew, whose thousands had entrenched me round about, and lay as thick upon my battered crest as on an anvil with their ponderous glaives. Yet marble courage still did underprop, and when my weary arms with often blows, like the continual labouring woodman's axe that is enjoined to fell a load of oaks, began to falter, straight I would record my gifts you gave me, and my zealous vow, and then new courage made me fresh again, 
that in despite I carved my passage forth, and put the multitude to speedy flight. Lo, thus hath Edward's hand filled your request, and done, I hope, the duty of a knight. Ay, well thou hast deserved a knighthood, Ned, and therefore with thy sword yet reeking warm. His sword, borne by a soldier. With blood of those that fought to be thy bane, Arise, Prince Edward, trusty knight-at-arms. This day thou hast confounded me with joy, And proved thyself fit heir unto a king. Here is a note, my gracious lord, Of those that in this conflict of our foes were slain, Eleven princes of esteem, four score barons, A hundred and twenty knights, And thirty thousand common soldiers, And of our men a thousand. Our God be praised. Now, John of France, I hope, thou knowest King Edward for no wantonness, no lovesick cockney, nor his soldier's jades. But which way is the fearful king escaped? Towards Poitiers, noble father, and his sons. Ned, thou and Audley shall pursue them still. Myself and Derby will to Callis straight and there be begirt that haven town with siege now lies it on an upshot therefore strike and wistly follow whiles the game's on foot what picture's this a pelican my lord wounding her bosom with her crooked beak that so her nest of young ones may be fed with drops of blood that issue from her heart the motto sic et vos and so should you Exeunt. End of Act 3. Act 4 of The Reign of King Edward III, attributed in part to William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene 1. Britannia. Camp of the English. Enter Lord Mountford with a coronet in his hand, with him the Earl of Salisbury. My Lord of Salisbury, since by your aid mine enemy Sir Charles of Blois is slain, and I again am quietly possessed in Britain's dukedom, know that I resolve for this kind furtherance of your king and you to swear allegiance to his majesty in sign whereof receive this coronet bear it unto him and with all mine oath never to be but edward's faithful friend i take it mountford thus i hope ere long the whole dominions of the realm of france will be surrendered to his conquering hand exit mountford now if i knew but safely how to pass i would at calice gladly meet his grace whether i am by letter certified that he intends to have his host removed it shall be so this policy will serve ho who's within bring villiers to me enter villiers villiers thou knowest thou art my prisoner and that i might for ransom if i would require of thee a hundred thousand francs or else retain and keep thee captive still but so it is that for a smaller charge thou mayst be quit and if thou wilt thyself and this it is procure me but a passport of charles the duke of normandy that i without restraint may have recourse to calice through all the countries where he hath to do which thou mayst easily obtain i think by reason I have often heard thee say, he and thou were students once together, and then thou shalt be set at liberty. How sayest thou? Wilt thou undertake to do it? I will, my lord, but I must speak with him. Why, so thou shalt. Take horse, and post from hence. Only before thou goest, swear by thy faith, that, if thou canst not compass my desire, thou wilt return my prisoner back again and that shall be sufficient warrant for me to that condition i agree my lord and i will unfeignedly perform the same exit farewell villiers 
Thus once I mean to try a French man's faith. Exit. Act four, scene two. Picardy, the English camp before Calais. Enter King Edward and Derby with soldiers. Since they refuse our proffered league, my lord, and will not open their gates and let us in, we will entrench ourselves on every side that neither victuals nor supply of men may come to succor this accursed town. Famine shall combat where our swords are stopped. Enter six poor Frenchmen. The promised aid that made them stand aloof is now retired and gone another way. It will repent them of their stubborn will. But what of these ragged slaves, my lord? Ask what they are. It seems they come from Calis. You wretched patterns of despair and woe, what are you? Living men, or gliding ghost, crept from your graves to walk upon the earth? No ghost, my lord, but men that breathe a life far worse than is the quiet sleep of death. We are distressed, poor inhabitants, that long have been diseased, sick, and lame. And now, because we are not fit to serve, the captain of the town has thrust us forth, that so expensive victuals may be saved. A charitable deed, no doubt, and worthy praise. But how do you imagine, then, to speed? We are your enemies. In such a case we can no less but put ye to the sword, since when we proffered truce it was refused. And if your grace no otherwise vouchsafe, as welcome death is unto us as life. Poor silly men, much wronged and more distressed. Go, Derby, go, and see that they be relieved. Command that victuals be appointed them, and give to every one five crowns apiece. Exeunt Derby and Frenchman. The lion scorns to touch the yielding prey, and Edward's sword must flesh itself in such as wilful stubbornness hath made perverse. Enter Lord Percy. Lord Percy, welcome. What's the news in England? The Queen, my lord, comes here to your grace. And from her highness and the lord visagent, I bring this happy tiding of success. David of Scotland, lately up in arms, thinking, belike, he soon should prevail, your highness being absent from the realm, is, by the fruitful service of your peers, and the painful travel of the queen herself, that, big with child, was every day in arms, vanquished, subdued, and taken prisoner. Thanks, Percy, for thy news, with all my heart. What was he took him prisoner in the field? Our esquire, my lord, John Copland is his name, who, entreated by her majesty, denies to make surrender of his prize to any but unto your grace alone, whereat the queen is grievously displeased. Well, then, we'll have a pursuing dispatch to summon Copland hither out of hand, and with him he shall bring his prisoner king. The queen's, my lord, herself by this at the sea, and proposeth, as soon as winds will serve, to land at Calais, and to visit you. She shall be welcome, and to wait her coming I'll pitch my tent near to the sandy shore. Enter a French captain. The burgesses of Calais, mighty king, have, by a council, willingly decreed to yield the town and castle to your hands. Upon condition, it will please your grace, to grant them benefit of life and goods. They will so. Then belike they may command, dispose, elect, and govern as they list. No, sirrah, tell them, since they did refuse our princely clemency, at first proclaimed, they shall not have it now. Although they would, I will accept of naught but fire and sword, except within these two days, six of them, that are the wealthiest merchants in the town, come naked, all but for their linen shirts, with each a halter hanged about his neck, and prostrate yield themselves upon their knees, to be afflicted, hanged, or what I please, and so you may inform their masterships. Exeunt Edward and Percy. 
why this it is to trust a broken staff. Had we not been persuaded, John, our king, would with his army have relieved the town? We had not stood upon defiance so, but now tis past that no man can recall, and better some do go to rack them all. Exit. Act four, scene three. Poitieu. Fields near Poitieu. The French camp. Tent of the Duke of Normandy. Enter Charles of Normandy and Villiers. I wonder, Villiers, thou shouldst importune me for one that is our deadly enemy. Not for his sake, my gracious lord, so much am I become an earnest advocate, as that thereby my ransom will be quit. Thy ransom, man? Why needest thou talk of that? Art thou not free? And are not all occasions that happen for advantage of our foes to be accepted of and stood upon? No, good my lord, except the same be just. For profit must with honour be commixed, or else our actions are but scandalous. But letting pass their intricate objections, will please your highness to subscribe, or no? Villiers, I will not, nor I cannot do it. Salisbury shall not have his will so much, to claim a passport how it pleaseth himself. Why, then I know the extremity, my lord. I must return to prison whence I came. Return? I hope thou wilt not. What bird that hath escaped the fowler's gin will not beware how she's ensnared again? Or what is he so senseless and secure, that having hardly passed a dangerous gull, will put himself in peril there again? Ah, but it is mine oath, my gracious lord, which I in conscience may not violate, or else a kingdom should not draw me hence. Thine oath? Why, tat doth bind thee to abide. Hast thou not sworn obedience to thy prince? He in all things that uprightly he commands, but either to persuade or threaten me, not to perform the covenant of my word, is lawless, and I need not to obey. Why is it lawful for a man to kill, and not to break a promise with his foe? To kill, my lord, when war is once proclaimed, so that our quarrel be for wrongs received. No doubt is lawfully permitted us, but in an oath, we must be well advised. How do we swear, and when we have sworn, not to infringe it, though we die, therefore? Therefore, my lord, as willing I return, as if I were to fly to paradise. Stay, my Villiers. Thine honourable men deserve to be eternally admired. Thy suit shall be no longer thus deferred. Give me the paper. I'll subscribe to it. And wheretofore I loved thee as Villiers, hereafter I'll embrace thee as myself. Stay, and be still in favour with thy lord. I humbly thank you, Grace. I must dispatch, and send this passport first unto the earl, and then I will attend to your highness' pleasure. Do so, Villiers. And Charles, when he hath need, be such his soldiers, howsoever he speed. Exit Villiers. Enter King John. Come, Charles, and arm thee. Edward is entrapped. The Prince of Wales is fallen into our hands, and we have compassed him. He cannot escape. But will your highness fight to-day? What else, my son? He scarce eight thousand strong, and we are threescore thousand at the least. I have a prophecy, my gracious lord, wherein is written what success is like to happen us in this outrageous war. It was delivered me at Cressus Field, by one that is an aged hermit there. Reads. When feathered fowl shall make thine army tremble, and flinted stones rise and break the battle ray, then think on him that doth not now dissemble, for that shall be the hapless dreadful day. Yet in the end thy foot Thou shalt advance as far in England as thy foe in France. By this it seems we shall be fortunate, for as it is impossible that stones should ever rise and break the battle ray, or airy fowl make men in arms to quake, so is it like we shall not be subdued. 
or say this might be true yet in the end since he doth promise we shall drive him hence and forage their country as they have done ours by this revenge that loss will seem the less but all are frivolous fancies toys and dreams once we are sure we have ensnared the son catch we the father after how we can exeunt act four scene four the same the english camp enter prince edward audley and others audley the arms of death embrace us round and comfort have we none save that to die we pay sour earnest for a sweeter life at Cressyfield, our clouds of warlike smoke choked up those french mouths and dissevered them but now their multitudes of millions hide masking as twere the beauteous burning sun leaving no hope to us but sullen dark and eyeless terror of all ending night oh, this sudden mighty and expedient head that they have made fair prince is wonderful before us in the valley lies the king vantaged with all that heaven and earth can yield his party stronger battled than our whole his son the braving duke of normandy hath trimmed the mountain on our right hand up in shining plate that now the aspiring hill shows like a silver quarry or an orb aloft the witch the banners bannerets and new replenished pendants cuff the air and beat the winds that for their gaudiness struggles to kiss them on our left hand lies philip the younger issue of the king coating the other hill in such array that all his gilded upright pikes do seem straight trees of gold the pendants leaves and their device of antique heraldry quartered in colours seeming sundry fruits makes it the orchard of the asperides behind us too the hill doth bear his height for like a half moon opening but one way it rounds us in there at our backs are lodged the fatal crossbows and the battle there is governed by the rough chatillion <laughs> and thus it stands the valley for our flight the king binds in the hills on either hand are proudly royalized by his sons and on the hill behind stands certain death in pay and service with chatillion death's name is much more mighty than his deeds thy parcelling this power hath made it more as many sands as these my hands can hold are but my handful of so many sands then all the world and call it but a power easily ta'en up and quickly thrown away but if i stand to count them sand by sand the number would confound my memory and make a thousand millions of a task which briefly is no more indeed than one these quarters squadrons and these regiments before behind us and on either hand are but a power when we name a man his hand his foot his head hath several strengths and being all but one self instant strength why all this many oddly is but one and we can call it all but one man's strength he that hath far to go tells it by miles if he should tell the steps it kills his heart the drops are infinite that make a flood and yet thou knowest we call it but a rain there is but one france one king of france that france hath no more kings and that same king hath but the puissant legion of one king and we have one then apprehend no odds for one to one is fair equality enter a herald from king john what tidings messenger be plain and brief the king of france my sovereign lord and master greets by me his foe the prince of wales if thou call forth a hundred men of name of lords knights squires and english gentlemen 
and with thyself and those kneel at his feet, he straight will fold his bloody colors up, and ransom shall redeem lives forfeited. If not, this day shall drink more English blood than e'er was buried in our British earth. What is the answer to his proffered mercy? This heaven that covers France contains the mercy that draws from me submissive horizons. That such base breath should vanish from my lips to urge the plea of mercy to a man, the Lord forbid. Return and tell the king my tongue is made of steel, and it shall beg my mercy on his coward burgonet. Tell him my colors are as red as his, my men as bold, our English arms as strong. Return him my defiance in his face. I go. Exit. Enter another herald. What news with thee? The Duke of Normandy, my lord and master, pitying thy youth is so ingirt with peril, by me hath sent a nimble-jointed genet as swift as ever yet thou didst bestride, and therewithal he counsels thee to fly, else death himself hath sworn that thou shalt die. Back with the beast unto the beast that sent him. Tell him I cannot sit a coward's horse. Bid him to-day bestride the jade himself, for I will stain my horse quite o'er with blood and double-gild my spurs, but I will catch him. So tell the carping boy, and get thee gone. Exit Herald. Enter another Herald. Edward of Wales, Philip the second son to the most mighty Christian king of France, seeing thy body's living date expired, all full of charity and Christian love, commends this book, full fraught with prayers, to thy fair hand, and for thy hour of life entreats thee that thou meditate therein, and arm thy soul for her long journey towards. Thus have I done his bidding, and return. Herald of Philip, greet thy lord from me. All good that he can send, I can receive. But think'st thou not the unadvised boy hath wronged himself in thus far tendering me? Haply he cannot pray without the book. I think him no divine extemporal. Then render back this commonplace of prayer to do himself good in adversity. Beside, he knows not my sin's quality, and therefore knows no prayers for my avail. Ere night, his prayer may be to pray to God to put it in my heart to hear his prayer. So tell the courtly wanton, and be gone. I go. Exit. How, how confident their strength and number makes them. Now, oddly, sound those silver wings of thine, and let those milk-white messengers of time show thy time's learning in this dangerous time. Thyself art bruised and bit with many broils, and stratagems forepassed with iron pens are texted in thine honourable face. Thou art a married man in this distress, but danger woos me as a blushing maid. Teach me an answer to this perilous time." To die is all as common as to live. The one inswise, the other holds in chase. For from the instant we begin to live, we do pursue and hunt the time to die. First bud we, then we blow, and after seed, then presently we fall. And as a shade follows the body, so we follow death. If, then, we hunt for death, why do we fear it? If we fear it, why do we follow it? If we do fear, how can we shun it? If we do fear, with fear we do but aid the thing we fear to seize on us the sooner. If we fear not, then no resolved proffer can overthrow the limit of our fate. For whether ripe or rotten, drop we shall, as we do draw the lottery of our doom. Ah, good old man, a thousand thousand armours these words of thine have buckled on my back. Ah, 
what an idiot hast thou made of life to seek the thing it fears and how disgraced the imperial victory of murdering death since all the lives his conquering arrows strike seek him and he not them to shame his glory i will not give a penny for a life nor half a halfpenny to shun grim death since for to live is but to seek to die and dying but beginning of new life let come the hour when he that rules it will to live or die i hold indifferent exeunt act four scene five the same the french camp enter king john and charles a sudden darkness hath defaced the sky the winds are crept into their caves for fear the leaves move not the world is hushed and still the birds cease singing and the wandering brooks murmur no wonted greeting to their shores silence attends some wonder and expecteth that heaven should pronounce some prophecy where or from whom proceeds this silence charles our men with open mouths and staring eyes look on each other as they did attend each other's words and yet no creature speaks a tongue-tied fear hath made a midnight hour and speeches sleep through all the waking regions but now the pompous sun in all his pride looked through his golden coach upon the world and on a sudden hath he hid himself that now the under earth is as a grave dark deadly silent and uncomfortable a clamour of ravens hark what a deadly outcry do i hear here comes my brother philip all dismayed enter philip what fearful words are those thy looks presage a flight a flight coward what flight thou liest there needs no flight a flight awake thy craven powers and tell on the substance of that very fear indeed which is so ghastly printed in thy face what is the matter a flight of ugly ravens do croak and hover o'er our soldiers heads and keep in triangles and cornered squares right as our forces are embattled with their approach there came this sudden fog which now hath hid the airy floor of heaven and made at noon a night unnatural upon the quaking and dismayed world in brief our soldiers have let fall their arms and stand like metamorphosed images bloodless and pale one gazing on another Ay, now i call to mind the prophecy but i must give no entrance to a fear return and hearten up these yielding souls tell them the ravens seeing them in arms so many fair against a famished few come but to dine upon their handiwork and prey upon the carrion that they kill for when we see a horse laid down to die although he be not dead the ravenous birds sit watching the departure of his life even so these ravens for the carcasses of those poor english that are marked to die hover about and if they cry to us tis but for meat that we must kill for them away and comfort up my soldiers and sound the trumpets and at once dispatch this little business of a silly fraud exit philip another noise salisbury brought in by a french captain behold my liege this night and forty more of whom the better part are slain and fled with all endeavour sought to break our ranks and make their way to the encompassed prince dispose of him as please your majesty go and the next bow soldier that thou seest disgrace it with his body presently for i do hold a tree in france too good to be the gallows of an english thief my lord of normandy i have your pass and warrant for my safety through this land villiers procured it for thee did he not he did and it is current thou shalt freely pass i freely to the gallows to be hanged without denial or impediment away with him i hope your highness will not so disgrace me and dash the virtue of my seal at arms he hath my never broken name to show charactered with this princely hand of mine and rather let me leave to be a prince than break the stable verdict of a prince i do beseech you let him pass in quiet 
thou and thy word lie both in my command what canst thou promise that i cannot break which of these twain is greater infamy to disobey thy father or thyself thy word nor no man's may exceed his power nor that same man doth never break his word that keeps it to the utmost of his power the breach of faith dwells in the soul's consent which if thyself without consent do break thou art not charged with the breach of faith go hang him for thy license lies in me and my constraint stands the excuse for thee what am i not a soldier in my word then arms adieu and let them fight that list shall i not give my girdle from my waist but with a guardian i shall be controlled to say i may not give my things away upon my soul had edward prince of wales engaged his word writ down his noble hand for all your knights to pass his father's land the royal king to grace his warlike son would not alone safe conduct give to them but with all bounty feasted them and theirs dwellst thou on precedence then be it so say englishman of what degree thou art an earl in england though a prisoner here and those that know me call me salisbury then salisbury say whither thou art bound to calice where my liege king edward is to callis salisbury then to callis pack and bid the king prepare a noble grave to put his princely son black edward in and as thou travellest westward from this place some two leagues hence there is a lofty hill whose top seems topless for the embracing sky doth hide his high head in her azure bosom upon whose tall top when thy foot attains look back upon the humble vale beneath humble of late but now made proud with arms and thence behold the wretched prince of wales hooped with a bond of iron round about after which sight to callous spur amain and say the prince was smothered and not slain and tell the king this is not all his ill for i will greet him ere he thinks i will away be gone the smoke but of our shot will choke our foes though bullets hit them not exit act four scene six the same a part of the field of battle alarum enter prince edward and artois how fares your grace are you not shot my lord no dear artois but choked with dust and smoke and stepped aside for breath and fresher air breathe then and to it again the amazed french are quite distract with gazing on the crowds and where our quivers full of shafts again your grace should see a glorious day of this oh for more arrows lord that's our want courage artois a fig for feathered shafts when feathered fowls do bandy on our side what need we fight and sweat and keep a coil when railing crows outscold our adversaries up up artois the ground itself is armed with fire containing flint command our bows to hurl away their pretty colored you and to it with stones away artois away my soul doth prophesy we win the day exeunt act four scene seven the same another part of the field of battle alarum enter king john our multitudes are in themselves confounded dismayed and distraught swift starting fear hath buzzed a cold dismay through all our army and every petty disadvantage prompts the fear-possessed abject soul to fly myself whose spirit is steel to their dull lead what with recalling of the prophecy and that our native stones from english arms rebel against us find myself attainted with strong surprise of weak and yielding fear enter charles fly father fly the french do kill the french some that would stand let drive at some that fly our drums strike nothing but discouragement our trumpets sound dishonour and retire the spirit of fear that feareth not but death 
cowardly works confusion on itself enter philip pluck out your eyes and see not this day's shame an arm hath beat an army one poor david hath with a stone foiled twenty stout goliaths some twenty naked starvelings with small flints hath driven back a puissant host of men arrayed and fenced in all accompliments mordieu they quait at us and kill us up no less than forty thousand wicked elders have forty lean slaves this day stoned to death oh that i was some other countryman this day hath set derision on the french and all the world will blurt and scorn at us what is there no hope left no hope but death to bury up our shame make up once more with me the twentieth part of those that live are men enow to quail the feeble handful on the adverse part then charge again if heaven be not opposed we cannot lose the day on away exeunt act four scene eight the same another part of the field of battle enter audley wounded and rescued by two squires how fares my lord even as a man may do that dines at such a bloody feast as this i hope my lord that is no mortal scar no matter if it be the count is cast and in the worst ends but a mortal man good friends convey me to the princely edward that in the crimson bravery of my blood i may become him with saluting him i'll smile and tell him that this open scar doth end the harvest of his audley's war <sighs> exeunt act four scene nine the same the english camp enter prince edward king john charles and all with ensigns spread now john in france and lately john of france thy bloody ensigns are my captive colours and you high vaunting charles of normandy that once to-day sent me a horse to flee are now the subjects of my clemency fie lords is it not a shame that english boys whose early days are yet not worth a beard should in the bosom of your kingdom thus one against twenty beat you up together thy fortune not thy force hath conquered us an argument that heaven aids the right enter artois with philip see see artois doth bring with him along the late good counsel giver to my soul welcome artois and welcome philip too who now of you or i have need to pray now is the proverb verified in you too bright a morning breeds a lowering day sound trumpets enter audley but say what grim discouragement comes here alas what thousand armed men of france have writ that note of death in audley's face speak thou that wooest death with thy careless smile and looked so merrily upon thy grave as if thou were enamoured on thine end what hungry sword hath so bereaved thy face and lopped a true friend from my loving soul o oh, prince thy sweet bemoaning speech to me is as a mournful knell to one dead sick dear audley if my tongue ring out thy end my arms shall be thy grave what may i do to win thy life or to revenge thy death if thou wilt drink the blood of captive kings or that it were restorative command a health of king's blood and i'll drink to thee if honour may dispense for thee with death the never dying honour of this day share wholly audley to thyself and live victorious prince that thou art so behold a caesar's fame in king's captivity if i could hold him death but at a bay 
till i did see my liege thy royal father my soul should yield this castle of my flesh this mangled tribute with all willingness to darkness consummation dust and worms cheerily bold man thy soul is all too proud to yield her city for one little breach should be divorced from her earthly spouse by the soft temper of a french man's sword lo to repair thy life i give to thee three thousand marks a year in english land i take thy gift to pay the debts i owe these two poor esquires redeemed me from the french with lusty and dear hazard of their lives what thou hast given me i give to them and as thou lovest me prince lay thy consent to this bequeath in my last testament renowned audley live and have from me this gift twice doubled to these esquires and thee but live or die what thou hast given away to these and theirs shall lasting freedom stay come gentlemen i will see my friend bestowed within an easy litter then we'll march proudly toward callis with triumphant pace unto my royal father and there bring the tribute of my wars fair france's king exit end of act four Act Five of the Reign of King Edward the Third, attributed in part to William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One: Picardy, the English camp before Calais. Enter King Edward, Queen Philip, Derby, soldiers. No more, Queen Philip pacify yourself copland except he can excuse his fault shall find displeasure written in our looks and now unto this proud resisting town soldiers assault i will no longer stay to be deluded by their false delays put all to sword and make the spoil your own into six citizens in their shirts barefoot, with halters about their necks. Mercy, Gifford, mercy, gracious Lord. Contemptuous villains, call ye now for truce? Mine ears are stopped against your bootless cries. Sound drums alarm, draw threatening swords. Ah, noble prince, take pity on this town and hear us mighty king we claim the promise that your highness has made the two days respite is not yet expired and we are come with willingness to bear what torturing death or punishment you please so that the trembling multitude be saved my promise well i do confess as much but i do require the chiefest citizens and men of most account that should submit you peradventure are but servile grooms or some felonious robbers on the sea whom apprehended law would execute albeit severity lay dead in us no no ye cannot overreach us thus the sun dread lord that in the western fall beholds us now low brought through misery did in the orient purple of the morn salute our coming forth when we were known or may our portion be with damned fiends if it be so then let our covenant stand we take possession of the town in peace but for yourselves look you for no remorse but as imperial justice hath decreed your bodies shall be dragged about these walls and after feel the stroke of quartering steel this is your doom go soldiers see it done ah be more mild unto these yielding men 
It is a glorious thing to establish peace, and kings approach the nearest unto God by giving life and safety unto men. As thou intendest to be king of France, so let her people live to call thee king. For what the sword cuts down, or fire hath spoiled, is held in reputation none of ours. Although experience teach us this is true, that peaceful quietness brings most delight, when most of all abuses are controlled, yet insomuch it shall be known that we as well can master our affections as conquer other by the dint of sword. Philip, prevail, we yield to thy request. These men shall live to boast of clemency, and tyranny strike terror to thyself. Long live your highness, happy be your reign. Go, get you hence, return unto the town, and if this kindness hath deserved your love, learn then to reverence Edward as your king. Exeunt Citizens Now might we hear of our affairs abroad. We would, till gloomy winter were o'er spent, dispose our men in garrison a while. But who comes here? Enter Copeland and King David. Copeland, my lord, and David, King of Scots. Is this the proud, presumptuous esquire of the north, that would not yield his prisoner to my queen? I am, my liege, a northern esquire indeed, but neither proud nor insolent, I trust. What moved thee, then, to be so obstinate to contradict our royal queen's desire? No wilful disobedience, mighty lord, but my desert and public law at arms. I took the king myself in single fight, and like a soldier's would be loath to lose the least preeminence that I had won. And Copeland straight upon your highness' charge is come to France, and with a lowly mind doth veil the bonnet of his victory. Receive, dread lord, the custom of my fraught, the wealthy tribute of my labouring hands, which should long since have been surrendered up, had but your gracious self been there in place. But, Copeland, thou didst scorn the king's command, neglecting our commission in his name. His name I reverence, but his person more. His name shall keep me in allegiance still, but to his person I will bend my knee. I pray thee, Philip, let displeasure pass. This man doth please me, and I like his words. For what is he that will attempt great deeds, and lose the glory that ensues the same? All rivers have recourse unto the sea, and Copeland's faith relation to his king. Kneel, therefore, down. Now rise, King Edward's knight, and to maintain thy state, I freely give five hundred marks a year to thee and thine. Into Salisbury. Welcome, Lord Salisbury. What news from Britain? This, mighty king, the country we have won, and John de Mountford, regent of that place, presents your highness with this coronet, protesting true allegiance to your grace. We thank thee for thy service, valiant earl. Challenge our favour, for we owe it thee. But now, my lord, as this is joyful news, so must my voice be tragical again, and I must sing of doleful accidents. What, have our men the overthrow at Poitiers, or is our son beset with too much odds? He was, my lord, and as my worthless self with forty other serviceable knights, under safe conduct of the Dauphin seal, did travel that way, finding him distressed, a troop of lances met us on the way, surprised, and brought us prisoners to the king, who, proud of this and eager for revenge, commanded straight to cut off all our heads, and surely we had died, but that the duke, more full of honour than his angry sire, procured our quick deliverance from thence. But, ere we went, Salute your king, quoth he. Bid him provide a funeral for his son. To-day our sword shall cut his thread of life, and, sooner than he thinks, we'll be with him. 
to quittance those displeasures he hath done this said we passed not daring to reply our hearts were dead our looks diffused and wan wandering at last we climbed unto a hill from whence although our grief were much before yet now to see the occasion with our eyes did thrice so much increase our heaviness for there my lord oh there we did descry down in a valley how both armies lay the french had cast their trenches like a ring and every barricado's open front was thick embossed with brazen ordnance. here stood a battalion of ten thousand horse there twice as many pikes in quadrant wise here crossbows and deadly wounding darts and in the midst like to a slender point within the compass of the horizon as twere a rising bubble in the sea a hostile wand amidst a wood of pines or as a bear fast chained unto a stake stood famous edward still expecting when those dogs of france would fasten on his flesh anon the death procuring knell begins off go the cannons that with trembling noise did shake every mountain where they stood then sound the trumpets clangor in the air the battles join and when we could no more discern the difference twixt the friend and foe so intricate the dark confusion was away we turned our watery eyes with sighs as black powder fuming into smoke and thus i fear unhappy have i told the most untimely tale of edward's fall oh me is this my welcome into france is this the comfort that i looked to have when i should meet with my beloved son sweet ned i would thy mother in the sea had been prevented of this mortal grief content thee philip tis not tears will serve to call him back if he be taken hence comfort thyself as i do gentle queen with hope of sharp unheard-of dire revenge he bids me to provide his funeral and so i will but all the peers in france shall mourners be and weep out bloody tears until their empty veins be dry and sere the pillars of his hearse shall be his bones the mould that covers him their city ashes his knell the groaning cries of dying men and in the stead of tapers on his tomb an hundred fifty towers shall burning blaze while we bewail our valiant son's decease after a flourish sounded within enter an herald rejoice my lord ascend the imperial throne the mighty and redoubted prince of wales great servitor to bloody mars in arms the frenchman's terror and his country's fame triumphant rideth like a roman peer and lowly to stirrup comes afoot king john of france together with his son in captive bonds whose diadem he brings to crown thee with and to proclaim thee king away with morning philip wipe thine eyes sound trumpets welcome in plantagenet enter prince edward king john philip audley artois as things long lost when they are found again so doth my son rejoice his father's heart for whom even now my soul was much perplexed be this a token to express my joy kisses him for inward passion will not let me speak my gracious father here receive the gift presenting him with king john's crown this wreath of conquest and reward of war got with as mickle peril of our lives as e'er was thing of price before this day install your highness in your proper right and herewithal i render to your hands these prisoners chief occasion of our strife so john of france i see you keep your word you promised to be sooner with ourself than we did think for 
and tis so indeed. But had you done at first as now you do, how many civil towns had stood untouched, that now are turned to ragged heaps of stones? How many people's lives mightst thou have saved, that are untimely sunk into their graves? Edward, recount not things irrevocable. Tell me what ransom thou requirest to have. Thy ransom, John, hereafter shall be known. But first to England thou must cross the seas, To see what entertainment it affords. How e'er it falls, it cannot be so bad, As ours hath been since we arrived in France. Accursed man! Of this I was foretold, But did misconster what the prophet told. Now, father, this petition Edward makes to thee, Whose grace hath been his strongest shield, that as thy pleasure chose me for the man to be the instrument to show thy power, so thou wilt grant that many princes more, bred and brought up within that little isle, may still be famous for like victories. And for my part, the bloody scars I bear, and weary nights that I have watched in field, the dangerous conflicts I have often had, the fearful menaces were proffered me, the heat and cold and what else might displease, I wish were now redoubled twentyfold, so that hereafter ages, when they read the painful traffic of my tender youth, might thereby be inflamed with such resolve as not the territories of France alone, but likewise Spain, Turkey, and what countries else that justly would provoke fair England's ire, might at their presence tremble and retire. Here, English lords, we do proclaim a rest, an intercession of our painful arms. Sheath up your swords, refresh your weary limbs, peruse your spoils, and after we have breathed a day or two within this haven town, God willing, then for England will be shipped, where in a happy hour, I trust, we shall arrive, three kings, Two princes and a queen. End of Act Five. End of the reign of King Edward the Third, attributed in part to William Shakespeare.